So the meeting is the 21st of July 2022 and it's in the Blackwood Uniting Church. Thanks to our guest speaker, Rod, Rod, Rod Cunningham. Yeah, and I hope you know him. And uh, he's going to give you a very interesting talk about a remote right. Carry on, I'll hand you the microphone. Thanks, Phil, and thanks for the opportunity to talk. And uh, I live in the Ross Valley, uh, Uruguta, and we used to live at uh, Mintura in the Clay Valley. So we've sort of come closer to Adelaide. And uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, rise and wherefores of doing a remote station. It's a bit of an open recipe book. You can do it a number of ways. And uh, my way is just one way. So uh, I guess the first question is why? Why would you want to do it? Well, back, uh, back in the 70s, 80s, the average block of land in Australia was a quarter acre block and that was 1,000 square metres. 2005, it was down to about five to 600 square metres. And I looked up the other day and the average size of a block of land in the cities is about 400 square metres and some even smaller. So no room for antennas on small allotments. You're not going to put up your 50 metre tower, guide tower on a block like that. The other thing is you may live in a retirement village or apartment. We're living in smaller places. Sometimes we've got to move into something where we get a bit of care and support. Some people live in apartments and you've probably seen pictures of magnetic loops sitting on their verandas and people hanging fishing rods out the window with the lines on them for antenna. Property encumbrances. Now we started to buy a house in the Clairvat in at Nuriupa and my wife had already committed that it was definitely going to be a house. And then the agent said, oh Rod, there's something about an encumbrance but it's not a problem. <laughs> I said, oh right. So she sent it to me. I read clause 3.2.3 that no external sign or hoarding or any tank or any mast or pole of any description or television antenna or radio will be erected or made on or over the land or any part of it da 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 da, da without the prior written approval of the encumbrancy. <laughs> well, I didn't cancel, I, I would have been divorced if I cancelled the contract. So we went ahead with it and I knew I couldn't do much from home, but fortunately I had started to do this remote station. You may live in a rental property and obviously a landlord's not going to be over happy with you whacking up a tower in the backyard with some concrete footings that you can't dig out. And it's our urban environment now has just got so noisy. There's power supply, solar, lead uh, lighting, all sorts of home electronics and it's not just your home, it's the neighbours around you and it's pretty hard to time. So it's become a real problem. And the last one is your own transmitter might cause a bit of interference, could be quite good, but there you are sitting next to Benson's radiology in your nice shack with the one kilowatt amplifier <laughs> and the eight element lock periodic pointing their way and you put off all their uh, scanning machines and whatever. So yeah, that could be a bit of a problem too. So that's why a number of reasons why there's, there's others. or well, age and mobility. You can't climb towers, you can't get on the shed roof. It's getting difficult to do the things you want to do to build and keep the station operating. Well, how? One of the ways that people already are doing quite a bit of is using an SDR receiver and uh, there are probably about four, five, six around Adelaide. AREG have done a couple of, and uh, there's two or three up in the hills and a couple of others as well. And that often overcomes the noise on reception. You can use your computer, get on one of those, play it through the computer speakers and still use your transmit. It's a little bit of a juggle between transmit, receive, and turning down volume, etc. But it's, it's a way of getting a signal, a reasonable signal. 
There could be club stations. I know the South East uh, Radio Group have got their own club station for members. And if you look on remotehams.com, there's probably about 10 club stations in Australia. So there's a number of them dotted around. Usually they restrict them to the club membership, but it's a way to go. If you, put, you go to Facebook or Google and put in a remote ham radio, you'll get lots of ideas and uh, be able to see a number of the stations. So your station might well look like that's that computer on the desktop or a speaker. That's as simple as it needs to be with a microphone. Or you've got a little handheld tablet. Uh, that's a Raspberry Pi based thing and uh, they're available in the US. So that's a couple of ways of having something at home. Or you could go and rent a station. <laughs> if you go and have a look, you can rent. There's a site, I think, called Big Stacks or something like that. And uh, I just picked out one of them. It usually costs uh, a dollar a minute if you want to run the kilowatt amplifier. And uh, there on 40 metres, you can use the four element yard at 140 feet. And I'm sure you'd work a bit of DS with that. So that's another way to go. Getting in and out of it can be a bit tricky with delays in the internet and that, but it is another way people uh, do some of their DX work and uh, work from home. There's plenty, or not plenty, but there's a bit of proprietary remote control software. You used to make a package, I can make a package, that usually generally works only with their top line transceivers. They're good packages. You can work the station remotely. Sometimes you need, need two bits of equipment and they're connected through the internet with this software or otherwise. The problem is it doesn't always do all the other management things like logging and antenna switching and rotating, etc. Or you can uh, get a bit of proprietary hardware. There's a couple of boxes called remote rig and uh, you can sit them either end of an internet link or even an ADSL link they say will work. There's another box called a rig pi and uh, it was when I designed two or three years ago. It's a little raspberry pi thing. It's got ports on the side for USB connections to your audio, ethernet, uh, microphone etc. That's a pretty convenient way to do it. You can actually download the software and build the hardware yourself. And uh, there's quite a good support base for that on the, on the internet. So that's the Rip Pi and there are a number of others. Now, that's where I lived. So I had a couple of towers, a couple of good antennas, an EME thing. So here we go to a new real plan, it's 430 square metres. The backyard's about uh, 12 metres by 8 metres, so it was pretty small. And there was a fair amount of ambient noise, there is. A little bit caused by me, but the rest by the neighbours, and as I mentioned, no antennas allowed. Not even a flagpole. I did apply to put a flagpole up out the front, but uh, no, that wasn't allowed. Well, he said to me, come, just do it in a couple of years' time, mate. We'll have finished all the subdivision and we won't be running around looking at things. Just go ahead and do it then, you'll be right. <laughs> so we lived in the mid-north and I stood there on this hill one day and I thought, where should I put my radio station? It's called a greenfield site actually. Do I want it on a hilltop, a rocky hilltop? Do I want it down on the flat? Do I want uh, something that's got a bit of height and elevation? And then I started to think through the, the issues of, of picking a site. And I've already been talking to somebody over here about their challenges at Finnis. And uh, it is a bit of a challenge picking a site. So we'll go through some of the things. First one is, obviously you don't want to pick a noisy site. So swirl lines, high voltage lines, electric fences. There's a few thing in the things in the country that can generate noise. In fact, one of the sites I picked initially, they were then announced they were going to put in a 300 hectare solar farm in the paddock next door. So uh, it hasn't happened finally, they cancelled it. So uh, what sort of power are you going to use? 
solar or batteries, solar and batteries, or 240 volts. I actually had 240 volts in the, in the place where I went, but the issues of metering and getting on with a farmer's wife could have been a bit of a challenge, so I, I elected to do my own. What antennas are you going to put up? Do you want towers or can you use trees? What support structures uh, can you put up? How stable will they be? How heavily will they be loaded with uh, wind and storms and all that sort of thing? Do you want line of sight to repeaters or do VHF work? I'm not a great VHFer, so that wasn't a, a, a driver in my case. How are you going to accommodate the equipment? Where are you going to put it so that it can't be pinched so it'll keep working in summertime or wintertime? Now just have a look. Here's a beautiful box, Swiss station, number of shelves, slide out uh, shelf at the bottom for the laptop, stack all the amplifiers, control boxes, antenna tuners in there. And you see it's got a bit of insulation taped inside the doors. So that's a very nice piece of uh, uh, accommodation to house the equipment that's just mounted on the antenna pole and there it all is and uh, looks very neat, probably pretty easy to break into and bend the doors open, that sort of thing. So that's uh, a, a um, pretty schmick way to go and there it is in winter time. Looks fantastic, one of the highest stations, amateur stations in the world. He put it up in 2019, he's replaced the antenna three times. So it's got ice loading, wind loading, a couple of long wire antennas on it, and the box. So uh, it's a very nice uh, setup. So the other thing on a remote site was uh, equipment accommodation and secure. Can people get into it? Can they pinch your equipment? Is it obvious that it's there? There's a number of issues in just making sure equipment stays there. And the last one is internet access. You need, need some good, reliable internet access. I've got to say, all the stuff I've looked at using mobile phone, a bit difficult. Uh, one of the things you want, I think you want, is a static IP address, and you can't always get that with a mobile uh, phone set up. And there are ways around that, but it's just a bit messier. And I had two options, the NBN or a local provider. And the last is, can you get there in summer and winter? Are the roads slippery? Is it through a grassy paddock? How can you get there? And this guy with his station again, you can see, he had a few challenges getting there to, uh, to do things on it. And it would be just great out there, just working in the breeze, summer you know, minus 10 degrees in a great day. So, yes, yeah, so picking the site is important. So back to reality. I went and saw a mate, he was a farmer, he bought extra land, he had a good shearing shed, and on this extra land he bought, there was a pretty average shearing shed. I'm sure the uh, union had banned it these days. But uh, it was plenty of room, a uh, bit rusty, a bit dilapidated, but uh, I said to John, can I put my station there? And uh, he said yes. So he and his wife, uh, we sat down and had a bit of a chat about it. That had a very nasty experience with a grain bin and a swirl line. And very luckily, the guy that worked for them wasn't killed, burned to death when they tangled up in the swirl line at night. So any piece of wire that goes across to where machinery was going to go was quite an issue to them and they were concerned about it. You know, 100 watts isn't going to do too much, but you know, from their point of view, there was a concern. So uh, in this agreement, and it's just one page, I just said what equipment was going to be there, so it was clear. The rental we worked out, and that's a dozen bottles of white wine a year. <laughs> I pointed out that I'd need access to fix the thing up or change things and my NBN or internet contractor might want access and I just tell them the day before by phone call that somebody will be there and that's quite all good. All good. I said I wouldn't cause interference to the farm operations. Um, they were concerned that it might affect their auto steer on the tractor in the paddock or something. I don't think it ever will. 
and uh, they weren't responsible for my equipment at all. I would insure my equipment. That was it. How they could send notices to me if they weren't happy with things. And if I drop dead, well, they can pull the gear out after telling, sending a notice and giving three weeks notice. So it just made it very clear who was doing what, who was responsible for what, and gave them some comfort. So my design was mainly HF, possibly a bit of six metres and two metres. I'm happy with wire antennas, and I put up a vertical for six and two metres. I put a pole on the end of the shed, and there was a tree 50 metres away, which was a very substantial tree. So that was good to put the antenna on. Uh, I put up a solar array with two 300 watt panels. When you think of 300 watt, that's 600 watts, that's uh, 12 volts, 50 amps. That's a very reasonable amount of power. You don't really need that much when the sun is shining. But when it's a very grey day, it's overcast, you still can get enough skylight through the clouds to triple charge that battery. I put in a 150 ampere hour battery. Now that's probably a little bit small. It depends how much you're going to use the radio. Are you going to do 24 hour contests in the middle of winter when the sun doesn't shine? If that's the case, you'll want more power and more battery than that. I was, uh, I had a ACU FT991 transceiver and that's really, does all the bands I wanted, all the modes I wanted. And the good thing was it, it's got a USB port on the back and it's very easy to control and there's good software to manage it. I didn't want to use fancy software. I'm not into setting up uh, networking and servers and that sort of thing, and some of the software is based on that. I, it's a bit hard for me. I wanted a static IP on the internet link, and I wanted to be able to control and monitor how things are going. I came out, I worked in the broadcasting industry for a while. It's always the nice night Nice to know you've got power. Nice to know the sun is shining. Nice to know what other boxes are doing in the place that the fans are operating, etc. So uh, I put in a, a box to do that uh, monitoring. That's the box. It's called a TP DIN. That's because it goes on a DIN rail. It's only about uh, four to five inches high. And uh, it's a smart little thing. It uh, measures four voltages up to 80 volts, so that means it can measure the solar panels. It has four current measurement uh, shunts through it. It has an external shunt that will go as high as you like. Two 20 amp uh, shunts and a 10 amp one. So it will measure those currents. It will measure, it has an internal thermocouple that tells you the temperature and you can plug in an external one. Uh, four relays and two of them are normally closed and two normally open so you can control those remotely. It's got a data logger and alarms that will actually send you a message if the battery is getting a bit flat. You can access it via a web browser and that works pretty well. It'll run off a whole range of voltages but 10 volts to 57 volts. It'll operate from minus 40 to 75 degrees C. Now I don't think your transceiver will work over that range. So <laughs> It, uh, it's got a good range, it sits on the DIN rail, it's, uh, I think they cost about $300. And on that top of those green terminals, they're actually plugs and you can pull them out and wire through them. So I use that as the basis. That's just one of the screens, the monitor screen, and uh, you can put your cursor over any of those uh, switches there, open them or close them. Uh, I've got one to isolate the router and link power. Operating that means you lose your link and lose your control. But there is a cycle function there that will open it for 30 seconds and restore it. So you do get your link and control back. I learned that the hard way, but that was just if anything ever locked up, I could take the power off. I've never had to use it. A PC reset. And uh, I haven't ever used that, and I'll explain why a bit later. Transceiver power is the one I use the most, so uh, there the transceiver is on. And uh, the cabinet fan, I can turn that on. And it also comes on and off with some uh, power, with some uh, temperature settings on the relays. So you can see the solar volts. 
That's only half the voltage, so it's around about 66 volts. The battery volts are 13.4. The power on the little ASUS processor, just on 18 volts. Uh, we need to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the power's gone. Uh, the link router, uh, 24 volts normally. And you can see how much the uh, ASUS uh, little PC is taking. Uh, the cabinet fan is off. The battery current is 2.5 amps. The shared temperature 11.8 and the, inside the uh, monitoring box 24.6. So uh, that's pretty good. And there's a whole lot of other things there. You can set your relays to operate under certain conditions. You can uh, some system parameters. You can. Uh, put some offsets on your voltages and that. Um, you've got some network functions there as well, so it's a pretty good box. Oh, that's what I've just been through, so no change there. And uh, in and out, I had a couple of options. NBN was NBN uh, at Mintero, fixed wireless. But there's, uh, there's a few in the Mid-North, there's a few guys who make a good business out of doing the things that the NBN providers don't want to do. Special systems for farms down valleys and that sort of thing. I got a guy from, uh, from Borough, Tim Stockman, Goiter Connect. He had a package which was 49 bucks a month and that was uh, 15 download and 2 upload. It's a bit better than that. He had a static IP. He could offer me some security. Whenever you try and log on to this station, it checks your IP and says, who are you? If it's not the right IP, I won't let you in. So the only two people who can get into it are him, Tim and myself, so that, that's good. And he was happy to put the gear in my cabinet so that overcame some of the mounting and security issues. So Tim on the roof putting his dish, I think his tower is about uh, 11 k's away and there's my box, it's not fully equipped at that stage but um, Tim's, Tim's router is there and that router actually powered the dish up on the roof just had a power over ethernet, that was his little power supply that sat there and uh, there's my TP DIN sitting there the cabinet fan and the power distribution there and these two boxes here that's the uh, solar inverter and these are the solar and the battery isolators I'll show you one later on with the transceiver and a bit more gear in there right. yes quick one why you got that so the fans at the bottom where does the exhaust go ah good question <laughs> Um, it blows in there, and when the transceiver when the transceiver mounts on the door, and when it closes over, that flam fan is blowing in the back of the transceiver, uh, and behind there, there is a just a fan uh, grill with a filter over it, and uh, so the air goes out behind there. So on a hot day, and this shed gets hot, it, you know, 40 plus some days. Uh, it blows the air out at the back of the Victron charger, so yeah, that's how it works. Gets a bit of dust out, there's a filter on that, and uh, every three or four months I just wash out the filter and it, it's good. But you've got to be wary of insects getting into it. So this was uh, the basic configuration. You've got the, the dish up the top, and uh, and it's powered over Ethernet. Tim sets up his router so it, it interfaces with the dish. He won't let anyone inside his routers. Uh, doesn't want people stuffing them up. So you can use these four ports here. So I've got one to the PC and transceiver, one to an IP uh, security camera to record the robbers before they uh, break into things. <laughs> The TP DIN sits there on one of the ports, so I just put in the address of the router on that port number and it talks to it. And out of that I can control my DC and antenna relays and the 12 volt, 28 volt power supply um, feeding the thing. 
So over on the left you've got the dish on the roof and a couple of solar panels and they probably hold the roof down as that uh, <laughs> nails are that rusty or loose. And on the end I've got the isolators for the battery. So if this thing went crazy and I, and I couldn't get there, I could ring up the farmer and say, John, can you just go and flip both of those switches off and I completely turn the whole, whole thing off. Take the, uh, the solar array off it and uh, that's the Victron uh, solar inverter. And they're quite a good inverter, they're not real cheap and they give some reasonable diagnostics and uh, a good readout on an iPad or something. So there's the power supply, the panels, um, the Victron, I've got the big shunt which will go up to 50 odd amps and the deep cycle battery so normally charging down through there. I take off the supply for the fuses and that and uh, these things are the connections to the TP DIN panel for measuring the voltages and, and current. And the battery, I built my own battery box and I use security screws to the floor, to the box, and uh, even the weight of the battery is going to deter anyone from flogging it. So you really do need a special screwdriver to uh, to get into it or, and, or, and to take the battery out. Power supply design, uh, I picked the, the solar. Um, there was 240 at the shed, as I said, but it was going to be, I'd have to put my own metering on it. The transceiver was 25 amps, and uh, because it's a typically mobile transceiver, it's good from about 14 and a half down to about 11 and a half volts. I wasn't going to put a linear in. If you did a linear, you probably need uh, 50 volts DC. Uh, I don't. I'm not a huge operator. I don't do 24-hour competitions and that sort of thing. The standing load, which was fairly important, was, which is the link the TPD monitoring box and the mini PC which runs all the time is 1.4 amps, 18 watts. So that, uh, that's pretty good and uh, that worked out better than I expected. I guess when you design something like this you've got to think well how long won't the sun shine for? And uh, two, three days. It'll keep it, the battery topped up if you're not operating but if you're operating a lot it does start to knock it around. So that was the battery I picked, 150 ampere hour. I think it was about 600 bucks and it weighs about 50 kilos. But it's interesting when you look at batteries, if you discharge a lead out as a battery to 80%, I think its lifetime is around about uh, 8,000 cycles. If you discharge that same battery to 20%, then it halves its battery life. Lead out of batteries even though it says it's a deep cycle, really don't like being cycled that deeply. And uh, I'd have to say lithium iron is probably a better proposition. It was too expensive when I did this about three years ago. Uh, the other good thing about lithium iron is that its open circuit cell voltage is a bit higher, even when it's quite discharged. It's a bit higher than a, a lead acid battery, so that means it's that's propping your transceiver up a little bit better. Question? Yeah? Do you, do you equalise the battery? No, it's only a single 12 volt cell. I, I think my understanding is the charger wax a fair boost into it initially and then it drops it back and I, I can never return, remember the term Victron use. I think you have to equalise if you had several batteries but not with just just the one. I think it's quite all right. I was just talking about cells, equalising the cells. You can't get at them too. No, no, but when you equalise, you return the bring them up. Yeah, well look, each day it charges to about 14.4 volts. So it, it does have for a certain period of time, then drops back to its normal flood, flood mode. And I think Victron have got that pretty well sussed, I think, I hope. So, antennas, I whacked up a pole on the end of the shed. It's about an eight metre pole and I stuck the whip on top and I used an end fed half wave and that was an uh, antenna and that was good enough. I can tune up with the 
transceiver tuner and okay I didn't need a fancy tuner or anything else the transceiver will tune to it I've got a little bit long at the moment so it doesn't work great on 10 meters but it meant I didn't need any of the HF bands any band switching and for VHF I put a 6 meter and a 2 meter whip sitting out in a paddock like that you'll never protect anything against a lightning strike it will just blow, blow it all to bits, but a nearby strike zone, so the power lines, the trees or the sheds, then uh, a bit of protection is, I think, helpful. And uh, so I've put a reasonable loose in there, and when the station is not on, the relays just disconnect the antennas from, from the transceiver and earth them. So hopefully that adds some added protection. The only messy thing with my transceivers is you've got HF and 6 metres coming out one hole and then 2 metres and 70 centimetres out of the other. And I had a 6 metre, 2 metre whip which meant I needed to do a little bit of switching. Well this is the characteristics of the antenna. It's probably, you probably can see that. So 80 metres the dip, 40 metres, 30 metres, 20 metres uh, 15, 17, whatever, so yeah, 15 there. So it works out pretty well that there's a reasonable point where you can get a fairly uh, good tune without too many problems on an MFET half weight. The other thing is they're not so critical about height. Because of, I'm not an antenna expert, but I'd say because it's a high impedance antenna, you're in it, and you've got a 49 to 1 ballon on it, it doesn't seem nearly as sensitive to the impact of the Earth being closer to Earth. And uh, to me, it, it's a, a reasonable proposition if you haven't got your antenna up a 20 metre pole or something. So that's the configuration there. The big tree on the end with a counterpoise on the end of it. And uh, across here, and there's the, the ballon up on the pole feed it down inside and there's a big earth just sitting outside there and the whip up on top and uh, it's high enough to get any farm machinery underneath it all farm machinery is no higher than six meters on top so that's standing on the ridge of the shed roof and uh, that tree you see uh, just in the distance is where the antenna up is and there's a nice fork up there and uh, a nice spot to be up there. I put some uh, the antenna changeover so I could switch to the whip when it was on HF. Um, I put some switching up at the top there and you can see the two, um, two uh, lightning arresters there on the outside, earthing connected etc. So uh, I, I ended up putting that on the outside of the box. That sort of stuff I'd prefer to have outside than lightning hitting things and wanting to get inside. <laughs> I used a little mini PC, you can get them all, all sorts. That's a little Intel one. They call them a NUC, the next unit of computing. I think it was a nice name for the future. Asus called them a, a mini PC. And uh, I've got one that runs, that was the first one I, I had and it didn't have a fan inside and I mounted a fan on the outside of it and uh, that was a, it was called a PN20 so I've got one now with a slightly bigger processor and that one now has a cooling fan inside it under bias control and temperature control as I mentioned it's low power, 10 watts on oil, 36 watts at, at maximum you can buy the boxes with various uh, memory options and processors but it, FT8 decode time, I only run it on the fast setting, but it usually gives me two and three seconds at the end of a decode to pick the station I want and come back in response to the CQ. It, it isn't fast enough on the deep decodes to get all that decoding done before the next uh, sweep. I uh, need an 18 volt supply, I've got one from Minikits, and uh, I actually initially ran it off these boxes, are, most of them will run off 12 volts, but once it got down to about 11 and a half or 11 volts, it got a little bit uh, unstable. And I had a couple of drives up there and I thought, no, I'll put it on 18 volts. 
my wish list, and that box on the table actually has it, is power on, uh, reset on power on. So it means if you turn the power off, it actually resets the computer and comes up and boots up without you having to sit there and do anything to it. So if you want to reset your computer, you turn it off, turn the power on, and it comes up. The ASUS won't do that. Uh, it hasn't got that function in the BIOS, but it's a good one to have. So the other thing is, Mr. Microsoft will come along and do an update, or you're not thinking about it, and then to do an update, you've got to do a restart. But remotely, I can restart it okay, it works okay. So that's the configuration, um, just a straight USB between the transceiver and the uh, PC and I've whacked a webcam on there. I get the audio using Skype. Transmit and receive audio comes over Skype and it works pretty well. And I'm thinking, well, Skype will do a video cam, webcam as well. So I stuck that there and that just looks at the front and screen of the transceiver and it's a, an easier, quicker way to do it. And I just take up a, a um, a screen and a keyboard when I go up there to do any maintenance. Software, I am not a software engineer so it had to be simple and uh, I use Ham Radio Deluxe and that's good at controlling a whole range of transceivers. It's got a login package, it'll interface well with uh, WSJTX, it's got a good interface there and the logging also has been fixed up there as well. And uh, for audio, I just use Skype. So I make a Skype call from home to the remote side and uh, first time I did it, I couldn't believe it. I heard a band noise come back straight away and uh, Skype picked up the codex for the transmit and receive from the transceiver and it all and the webcam as I mentioned. I, I run my remote desktop using Windows 10 Pro there's a very few packages and I'll talk about that in a minute. A trick I learned after a while was I couldn't use the same, um, same uh, Maidenhead locator for both of my stations. I had to use a different one for the remote station for the logging and that. So this is sort of the ham radio operator here. Skype doesn't give you fantastic audio for communication so I've put it through a graphic equaliser and that rolls off all the lows. I've got Ham Radio Deluxe there at home. I just go log on, tell it to go to that IP from home, and it goes, and there it is. The mini PC connects the transceiver. I set up the Skype, click on Skype at the bottom here, sets up the Skype call, I've got the audio and uh, the webcam shows me what's happening on the screen. Ham Radio Deluxe does that as well. Yes, it is good software. Um, you can use various things for remote desktop. TeamViewer is one that a lot of the computer maintenance companies use. It's good they search free for hobbyists. The problem is when you connect the transceiver up for eight hours a day and they can't work out what the data is that's going across it, and say, no, you're not a hobbyist, we'll charge you. So it does start to get expensive. I've not used it, but it's Google Chrome Remote. And I use, as I mentioned, the Windows Remote Desktop. But that works best with Windows 10 Pro. There are others. I think the things you've got to look at is the cost, the speed, and the functionality. I had this Russian package to start with, which all the hackers use, apparently. But it was hosted on some computer in Russia and the delay time was about two seconds. So, <laughs> so I don't know what when you do remote desktop. Obviously, Microsoft somewhere in Australia have got a mainframe that switches it through. When I put in this IP, switches it through to there, and uh, it all happens. And uh, similarly with Skype. So delays in the internet are a bit of a factor. So that's my desk at home. I've got two screens. So that's the remote station screen with Ham Radio Deluxe and there's buttons there to change filters and tune the thing and turn the Vox on and set the frequency and the bands. And over here, that's just 
the webcam looking at the front of my transceiver. Now over here you've got an S meter or a power meter, but this is a bit more, it's faster, it's more responsive. And if you see it flicking up in the red, you know you've got enough audio there just to test mic. And that I just use at home for a bit of listening on 6 metres and 10 metres. So that's my remote station there. Uh, yeah, all the buttons. And you can get various configurations, uh, modes and all that sort of thing. But uh, to me it works well. And you actually can send some control codes as well. I've not mastered it. But if you want to send something to the transceiver to say to set it up for repeaters, you can do that too. That's the Skype camera. Just a display on the uh, front of the transceiver. You can't obviously press those buttons, but the main thing is the power output there on transmit uh, or the uh, signal strength. So that's the thing in the shed, the box on the wall, the cabling, the battery down the bottom, and uh, the issues though are thermal, that's a, a west facing wall and it gets hot. And uh, I thought of putting a box out in the open, you know, a couple of piles out in the paddock or on top of a hill, that would be a lot worse I reckon. And uh, I have a problem with dust in the fan a bit. I've got to clean it out now and then. It's a double lock box and I got it from one of the electrical supply companies out at Salisbury and it's a pretty sturdy box, about 600 by 450. I probably should have gone a bit bigger. The rats, the rats run along there, the rats run up there, the rats sit on the back, the rats appear on the top. The rats like it, it's warm in winter time. And the mice too, probably. And you can see where they've been around the battery box as well. So uh, vermin in the country is a little bit of an issue. Do they eat much of the cable? Do they chew much of the cable? No, they, they haven't. I've, every now and then I drop a few handfuls of baits there, but they haven't. I haven't noticed any chewing on the cable or anything like that, which is good. Well, that's hamster radio. Hamster radio. <laughs> <laughs> so family on the bottom. The PC there, power there, a few cables around, and you can see just the transceiver there. And up the top are the isolating relays for the antenna connections and turning on the power of the transceiver and the router there. Um, sitting in there is the 50 amp shunt and a uh, little mini kits power supply just taped onto the a PC there and uh, yeah, it's all good. Do you run your fan all the time? No, I don't run the fan all the time. It'll cut in if it gets hot and sometimes if I'm, you know, I think it's going to be a bit emotional, I'll, I'll turn it on remotely. But no, I don't. Particularly in winter time, it's only going to put dust on the filter. So there's the transceiver sitting there. <laughs> First time I put it there, one of the farmer's uh, son said to me, he said, look, that's What's that talk going on in that thing that box in the corner? <laughs> Forgot that the speaker was still online, so I, I just whack a blind plug in the uh, earphone socket to cut it off. I don't need the microphone. There's a bit of a trick with these transceivers. Because you're using the rear connection on it, it means some of the filtering and some of the functions aren't as you would think they would be if you had the microphone and operated it from the pa front panel. You look through the book and you think, oh yeah, this is a setting. But then you realise it's only a front panel setting and not a rear panel setting. <coughs> the circuit diagram, it's been changed a bit. And uh, one of these days I'll get round to uh, drawing it up properly. But you've got quite a few monitor points where it's connected through the TPDN to measure the voltages and that sort of thing. So uh, that pretty well is it. A shack in a shearing shed and uh, for me it's been a good way to go and uh, I certainly enjoy using them. Thank you. I'm happy to do questions.
sure people have some questions. Yeah, that encumbrance, are you able to contest it? Pardon? The encumbrance, are you able to contest it? Ah, uh, look, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I, what they do, they want to keep, they want to keep the suburbs looking nice. So you've got to build a house back a certain distance. You can't build a fence that's right up. Can't put a carport out the front. So they want the place to look nice so people build there and da 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 da. So they don't want towers sticking up above the rooftops. I've got a fairly high whip antenna at the moment. I don't think, I mean, you've got to sign the encumbrance to buy the block of land. So they'd say, well, you're informed, you accepted it, can't come back now and debate it. But they do say no uh, approval will be unreasonably withheld. So you might, but I, I haven't worried about it. It's, it's similar to what I have in the States with what they call Homeowners Association, HOA, and all sorts of people have problems with that. And put a, in America, you can put up a flagpole without getting approval. But in Australia, you can't, apparently. Yeah, so. Do you have a strata title or community title, something like that? Gotta... No, look, I don't know what would happen with a strata title or community. community a strata title, you'd have to get approval of a strata body, which is the a group of the owners of that group of houses. In this case, the developer, in our case it was Higginbotham's, have done about three or four or five hundred homes on the edge of Nyeriupa, and, uh, and that's part of their conditions of buying their land, and that's to keep it looking nice. And it does look nice, except there's no towers. <laughs> yeah. Do you monitor the Victron? Um, I have got some interfaces, but maybe you don't need to do that. I don't need to do it. Look, I can tell the, the outputs there. I've gone there with the iPad. I've, I've had to do a bit of calibrating between the TPD voltages and the Victron voltages, and I'm still trying to get that quite right. I reckon the Victron is either putting in a bit too much voltage or one of my voltage settings isn't right. And I can play with those because there's an offset function in the box. But I only check it when I go there. But um, you, you do with the Victron have to set it for the type of battery. Yep. There's six or seven different settings. And you have to pick the right one for the battery. And there's obviously settings there for a lithium as well. Yeah. The Victron's fairly quiet. Yeah, I've never heard, and I've never heard of anyone having any noise problems with the Victron. Uh, electric noise problems, yeah. It's quiet, I mean, some days it's S0, S1 on 80 metres, it is quiet. And I, I haven't got any solar noise that I'm aware of at all. And the router's pretty good. The router's not bad. The microtech router, not noisy. Uh, no, um, no, no. It, I haven't specifically stuck a train, uh, radio or anything up against it. But uh, the antenna's out there anyhow, unless it picked anything up on the cabling, but it doesn't seem to at all. It is good, yeah. Yep. How many, how far away from home is it? Uh, it's uh, one hour and five minutes. So if you've stuffed up something, <laughs> the, on, on Ham Radio Deluxe, there's a power button, and one day I'll flick the power button. Some transceivers you can turn on with that power button. The FT991, the way I had it set up, you couldn't. So I was hopping the car and drive for an hour and turn it on again, set it up and drive back. So but I've only done that a couple of times, so yeah. How long have you been operating the station like that now? Is it like a super winter? Yeah, I've done summers and winters. It's been, um, yeah, I reckon I'd be close on two years. I sort of had to go back and do a couple of things after we moved to Newry and I've had a few trips to debug things and I've changed a bit of war in there but basically two years and you know, I, I sort of won't chase an FDA station if it's under about minus 18 you know with the power on running and all that sort of stuff but you know on the lower bands for just chatting away it's good I get 
good single reports on Ugly Motors and it is good. Yeah. Have you had any problems with the, the 991 with the temperature variations across the seasons? Not that I've noticed, no. No, it's, it's been alright. Some people have said the 991s get a bit dicky once they get under 12 volts. And I've got it down to probably 11 and a quarter a couple of times, which means the battery's getting fairly well down, but I've not, not had any problems. Yeah. Yeah, you're concerned about lightning strikes, right? Yes. Yeah, well, one way of reducing the high voltage coming in is to do a, a loop of the cable around. Yep. And your high voltage is at the top, and, and it lowers the, lowers the strike voltage. <coughs> The inductance of the cable. Yeah. 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 That's quite handy. Bit more damage. Does that? Yeah, on okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I haven't done that. I've brought it straight in, but yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, put a bit of Series L. Mm. You know. Yes. What sort of cost was it set up for you? Sorry. What sort of cost? <laughs> My wife's not here. <laughs> Look, I reckon it's about, depends whether you include the transceiver or not, and I had that, but it was probably about three, three and a half thousand. Yeah, it was 450 to do the, the link, and then it's, I mean, 50 bucks a month. The back of this year, 650. The box, um, the little computer, Probably they're about 650. They're not cheap, but you know that's certainly good and ideal for that situation. And then just other components here. You know, Realise lightning arresters weren't cheap, so um, yeah, about three and a half of that order. Yeah. 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 Thank mm -hmm. you.